so I'm kind of ill right now, sick. I'm a little bit sick. I just want to go over like um, some comments or so. Commenting on this one of Dogs video, and I don't know. I guess I was ups like upset him or something. Some of the stuff I was saying about the the, the hypostatic union stuff. So, and I apologize, I don't want to upset anyone, but I don't know, I just get tired of hearing the same debates over and over, over the ideas. And maybe some of them accusing me of like heresy or whatever, but I just wanted to clarify, like say that, uh, that no, I don't agree with you on your one subject idea anyway, like I'm saying I don't, I don't really agree with you, because I don't. <laughs> This is just to respond to some of these orthodox that call me like a heretic or whatever. Just because I believe in double subject. Sure, it's not orthodox as teaching to teach double subject. It's so bizarre because here I'm, I'm reading the same book. Sir of Alexander and Historian Controversy by Susan Whistle. Here in the chapter, Rhetoric and Cyril's Conciliar Homilies. Page 232. This is Ansarol's homiletic discourse. Words mattered. And Astorius's ill considered words had turned the world upside down. While Cyril's rhetorical arguments turned the world right side up, with the triumphant exalted Mary holding the scepter of orthodoxy at the top of Cyril's homily, had constructed an image of Nestorius that was so reprehensible to early 5th century sensibilities that Nestorius' vision of Mary could not prevail. I read that it's really Cyril's idea that turns things upside down. The impersonal human nature, how that uh, affects your person, right? Anthropology, I think it was, how you view all of that according to person. So you say an impersonal human nature, how oh, God is technically the one that completes the human nature, like as person, personalizing an impersonal human nature. I think it's error. Here's just talking about how Teotokos paradoxically contains like an uncontainable Christ in her vir in her virginal womb. Right, yeah, because he says like, and this is kind of the thing I was talking about. Like he even uses, uh, you know, Mary as like a, I guess like a metaphor or something for the temple of God. He says how um, God is in her, how God the Son is in her and she's the temple for him. Because then when he's born. Uh, it's like who is the temple for for God the Son, right? Like I get that God is in Mary because she's pregnant with him, and so in a symbolic way, the symbolism is there, right? Like how God is in His temple, but then it's like, um, but who is who is the temple for Jesus? Though, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like when uh, you say it's God the Son, right? No, you say God is in the temple of of Jesus, right? The Son of God or something like that. The one that is born is begotten of Mary and the Spirit of God. It's like, who is who's God in that person? And obviously they insist that it's God the Son. And it's like, who is the temple for God the Son? And then you say that it's also the Son. Not just not because of two persons though, because you, you don't believe in two persons. You say there is one impersonal impersonal nature. And so that's what I said. It's not two sons in person, but it's more like two sons in nature. How you try really hard to attribute the sayings of the human and the divine to one person. It's kind of the confusion of what I said and uh, confusing the persons of the Holy Spirit and the Son of God. Confusing the persons of the Holy Spirit and the Son of God. Now. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of tired because I was like ill for a week, like a, yeah, like about a week or so. Kind of 
Now there's like also the confusion when when like Moses is talking to the the Holy Spirit, right? The burning bush. God the Logos. You think he's talking to Jesus, but it's really Mary and and Moses who are more like Jesus, the type that Jesus types with God in them. You know how they have to have faith, right? How we're justified by the faith of the Son of God. Paladius of Amasea. Uh, this is in the meeting of the council, page 153. This is Paladius of Amasea, then requested that Nestorius' response to Cyril be read into the record. Concerned mostly with preserving the immutable and impassive essence of God the Word, Nestorius later attempted to explicate and elucidate elucidate St. Paul's vision of a Christ who somehow remained impassive in Godhead, but passive in his bodily nature. Uh, Christ's dual nature accounted for these contradicting qualities, according to Nestorius, as the words of sacred text demonstrate, especially in the various titles for Christ that Paul had used, while the term Christ embraced the conjunction of the natures. Nestorius claimed that each of the Paul, each of Paul's other titles over Christ, including Lord Jesus, Son, and Holy Begotten, corresponded to only one of these two distinct natures conjoined in Christ. That is how Nestorius had explicated his antiochene Christology, by which he attempted to demonstrate that the words of Scripture unambiguously supported his dual nature vision of Christ. While Cyril adhered to the symbol of Nicaea, placing his Christology. Within its synodal decrees, uh, Nestorius prefers the context of scripture in the process he may have secured his own demise. After Palladius introduced Nestorius' letter, Cyril asked whether Nestorius' doctrine conforms to the symbol of faith, set forth by the fathers of, at Nicaea. As president of the council, Cyril was able to shape its views. He thus presented a theory of councils that he had developed from his repeated throwing of Athanasius' anti-Arian discourse. Early in his episcopacy and throughout the exchange of the treatises prior to the council, whether the assembled bishops need only consider whether the doctrine being examined was consistent with that of Nicaea. It was a theory whose precedent, a precedent was the Second Ecumenical Council held in Constantinople in 381. Says, but the conciliar theory had nothing to do with Nestorius' argument. He had developed his Christology by arguing from scripture, using very little of the language from Nicaea. His method of arguing was therefore at odds with this test of for orthodoxy that the council proposed. When asked whether Nestorius' letter conformed to the Nicene symbol of faith, every one of the synodal members assembled at Ephesus, most of whom were partisans of Cyril, answered with a resounding no. Nestorius' letter uh, displayed a strange and innovative doctrine different from that of the orthodox faith, said, it, said the council. Uh, the bishops unanimously approved this assertion that they all exclaimed that Nestorius and his writings were anathematized along with anyone in communion with him. And so that's why not, what I'm saying is like it. it this is why I say it, it, this priest is weird. I don't know, this weird distortion. Like, if your tradition is from. Like, as far as in, when it comes to this issue on the Christology, like what is testified in scripture is not the same as what's testified in your creeds, or at least in, in interpretation. This is uh, way after Nicaea, this is according to a tradition, but then again, that's if that is how that is interpreted. But I don't know. I'm not an expert on the church history thing, I just know like that that's kind of the problem that I see. It's like you say that it's uh, that I'm heretical. That uh, I don't go according to according to the what church fathers consensus of the fathers, but then it's like I read, and it's like I'm not saying I do theology on my own, like I do read some of these saints, and then I read also like books like these where they say about this controversy because I pray to God and I get this uh, different understanding from what you're saying. So when I read these books, right about these controversies. And see how they're how a lot to do with your politics. Uh, this also goes over you know the reception of Nicaea political alliance over 
um, alliances, or political alliance onset of controversy. So I may not agree with everything the story says for Mobster Studio. But I'm saying that their biblical paradigm of double subject is, is from the Bible, from the apostles, not the one subject idea. And I say that one subject is to me paradigm ending because it's built on a falsehood of one person. Two persons, but not two sons. One in the man and the one being indwelt by the other, right? So that's what I'm saying. It's like. And this one is uh, the same one. So we'll, from Egypt of the Imperial City, this chapter, the meeting of the council. So the story is either denied that the deity of the only begotten had been incarnated, or he professed that the deity of the Father and the Holy Spirit became flesh along with the Word. Acacius further testified that one of the of the stories' colleagues declared in another discussion that the son who suffered the passion was different from God the Word, while another claimed that the Jews committed impiety not while uh, not against the, the deity not against the deity but only against the humanity of Christ. Uh, disgusted by this blasphemy, Acacius departed from the gathering. So, yeah, the son who suffered passion was different from God the Word. Yeah, because like I said, like, how God the Word better fits the Holy Spirit. And the son, the incarnate man, the dwelling place of God, is the one who suffers the human passions and all that stuff. It's by him, like every tabernacle for God, every temple for God has to have faith. How Paul says we're justified by the faith of the Son of God. So that's what I said, that, uh, I really believe that the incarnation of the Word of God has more to do with both, like, not just the, the birth, but also the baptism. How the Spirit of God is present at the birth, and incarnates the Son, right, the man, the person, the uncreated man, as I call him. And how the Spirit dwells the man without becoming the man, how he is side by side or, like, near the man, like you say, kind of like your hypostatic union. Where you say that he's uh, unified in two natures, one person. Which is what I was trying to say earlier. That that does lead to two sons. How well, like, you may say one person and two different natures. It creates two different son and application. It, two sons in nature. Because you have one person and two contradictory natures. That's so why you speak of him as dying and not as dead and not dead. So it's a bizarre way to discuss God is, and not God. So to say even though Jesus is God but it's like what became flesh the word the birth the one that is born and the conceived one is the son of God the word made flesh I really believe that has more to do with the nature of the person called the word how the person of the word the Holy Spirit has received the fullness of him in the son at the baptism that's how you will have your fullness of your incarnated word something like that I'm sorry, I'm still, like, recovering from being sick. Here in this, uh, chapter, Soil as Saint in the Byzantine Church, Resolution to Renewal of Controversy, page 282. It's talking about... At these proceedings, inhabitants of the city of Edessa testified against their bishop, Ebus of Edessa, alleging that he was guilty of subscribing to the views of Nestorius, but this inflammatory language was far removed from the reality of Ibas doctrinal confessions. In a letter addressed to Marius the Persian, Ibas had recounted the history of Cyril's conflict with Nestorius, saying that Nestorius' refusal to name Mary the Mother of God invited the accusation that Nestorius followed the heretic Paul of Samosota, who said that Christ was merely a man, as for Cyril, said Ibus, he had failed to distinguish the temple from him who dwells in it. And that was why he had been charged with Apollinarianism, right? Cyril of Alexandria. So this is basically what I was saying. Like, I'm going to God, wondering why, like, why something just seemed off about this teaching. Is it so basically basic this basically confirms what I was talking about, like the confusion of the persons. 
Erebus talks about how uh, for Cyril said it was he said Cyril failed to distinguish the temple from him who dwelt in it this is a big deal In the epilogue, it just says um, one main proportion portion of it. And he gets compressed into um, messes there. Cyril said that Nestorius' villainy was similar in scope and magnitude of that of Arius. He gets compressed into one swift rhetorical blow of the anti Arian discourse he had used intermittently, intermittently when the Nestorian controversy was beginning. Uh, Cyril was repeated repeating an assertion he made early on the Nestorius failure to accept the title Theotokos, Mother of God. For the Virgin Mary implied that Jesus was, that implied that Jesus was not God. A plain restatement of the charges raised against the Arians clearly a century before. It is unlikely that unlikely nonetheless that Cyril genuinely believed his opponent was guilty of Arianism, for he freely admitted when the controversy began that Nestorius could never have meant to subscribe to the tenets of Arianism. This was, uh, this is the footnote two says, see Cyril of Alexandria, Libri Contra Nestorium. This is, um, and then he says, Cyril's use of Athanasius' anti Arian discourse was also a strategy for ensuring that he and his partisans would be remembered as the next great defenders of Nicene Orthodoxy. In other words, the legacy Cyril inherited by using Athanasius' language is in a uh, new but comparable to circumstances secured his authority secured his authority as the quintessential protector and interpreter of Nicaea. Cyril's supporters readily embraced Cyril as the new Athanasius against Nestorius as the new Arius. Even while Nestorius was accusing Cyril, Cyril of Arianism, uh, Cyril's appropriation of Nicene orthodoxy was so complete that well after the Council of Ephesus, he remained the touchstone of orthodoxy for both Monophysite opponents and the Christological position adopted at Chalcedon, and for the Diophysite Chalcedonian bishops and their neo Chalcedonia supporters for at least the next 100 years. That's what I'm saying, like, this is why I don't, uh, this is why I don't hold tradition over truth. I just stop it there. So here I'm responding to the same guy on the, um, uh, the same guy I'm arguing with, I guess, on the universalism. He said, what I noted is that since you asserted, quote, universal salvation is a consequence of the work of Jesus, man has no freedom to choose otherwise, end quote. And he says, then all are saved, full uh, full stop. And so you're, you, so me, right, he says, you destroy ethics on your view. If uh, I die flying a plane into a building full of people in the name of a false god, then I'll be saved. I said, uh, so you're making too many assumptions. I said, one, I told them ethical problems come from a view of God that is unethical. A God of eternal punishment is not a remedy for immortality, or I'm sorry, immorality, since you become like the very God, that very same God that you're preaching. You know what I mean? That's the whole point of why those jihadist people will do what they do. That's how they view God. So that's how they become like God in that sense. Eternal torture inspired the cruel and unusual punishments on people who don't uh, who, who didn't agree with the institutional church uh, Just read the book the story of liberty and I told him to uh, universal salvation presupposes the God of Christ not a multi not a multitude of gods like the plurality of gods or whatever I said it presupposes the God of Christ uh, we are to be conformed to the image and likeness of Christ, who is the same as God in mind and spirit. That is to have the same mind and spirit of the one Savior and his God, and he's, as, as he sees God, as Jesus sees God, not as we see God, having all these contradictory views and things like that. that. That is the universalism I believe in, which you don't seem to grasp. 
Thus all flesh shall know God, and all, sh all shall see the salvation of God. Uh, this also goes back to my point in the video, how a man and his wife are to become one flesh. Uh, Jesus, his humanity, and his bride. Because my, 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 my uh, the, uh, the way I believe in the universal salvation, it presupposes judgment. So it doesn't presuppose irresistible grace and things like that. And this, uh, he responded with, he said, When will all humans who ever existed, quote, be conformed to the image and likeness of Christ, uh, who is the same as God in mind and spirit, have the same mind and spirit of the one Savior, and is God, as he sees God, all flesh shall know God, and shall see the salvation of God, like when does this happen, right? And I said, when and how, uh, that's up to God. That's what I told him, that it's up to God. Then he, he asks, uh, he says, yeah, he responded, you stated how many times, so you don't know when, but you do assert that all humans, whoever existed, will become conformed to the image and likeness of Christ, who is the same as God in mind and spirit. They have the same mind and spirit of the one Savior and his God, as he sees God. That all flesh, with, with all flesh, meaning all flesh, is in regardless of what you've done, what, yeah, regardless of whether you've done, or yeah, regardless, regardless of whatever God you worship, or whatever, and, uh, they shall know God, shall see the salvation of God, right? That's what he's asking me. And I, I responded to him, I said, When did I say that I know when the salvation of all will be? I said, I'm saying it's inevitable. Like, it doesn't imply I know the day and the hour. Or if it'll be in an age, or several ages or so. Yeah, because to me, the just like the judgment, it's inevitable. Just and so is the, the, uh, the salvation of all, right? It's like, I guess because he doesn't understand, like, that uh, resurrection, recapitulation, apocalypse tosses are three different things. Like, w resurrection of all people shall see the resurrection, right? So I guess, and if any, if any, if like, there's any part of salvation that's automatic, it would be the salvation from death, I guess. But uh, that does not mean everyone enters, you know, heaven, right? That place, that kingdom. And see, you can't enter there until you've been tried by fire, so that you you can like be in the kingdom somehow. I'm sorry, I'm still kind of ill. Like I'm, yeah, I'm sick. I'm still recovering from being sick, so I feel kind of drowsy. And so that's what I'm saying. Like recapitulation is like how he lives his life, right? Jesus, all that, like the will of man, all that stuff, the mind. That's all supposed to be. That's all. It all belongs to God anyway. Like that's what I'm saying. It's being conformed to God. The restoration of man. Like I was listening to this other orthodox, trying to say that there's a state of ill being or something in the eschaton or whatever, and I'm like, okay, well, like that can be seen as a chastisement from God, not an eternal state of being. Otherwise, that would make God um, guilty of creating a creation that is part fallen, that a state of being that suffers the effects of the sin or the fall. Right and the fall or whatever, that God creates a creation that is part fallen in that sense, like having been saved from the effects of the fall. That's how you get trapped in the state of ill being. I don't know. Cause it's like, can can God change your state of being, prevent you from praying to Him or something? Well, yeah, if God uh, sees that as worthy as a worthy chastisement, because both like angels and devils, right? Basically, people or those who know. Um, better, right? They know better, but they love evil and they don't want to repent of it. So yeah, those get chastised with even worse, or or even yeah, even people like who are servants, right? Who plead with Christ that they didn't, they don't want to be cast out of the kingdom or something. They don't want to be, they want to go into the kingdom, but Christ says, "Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness," right? Yeah, because those that know better that are supposed to be like servants or so, right, of Christ. Wearing his names, we are wearing his name. And I say, yeah, that's like it's up to God who receives many lashes, and and those who receive few, like those who who don't know any better, right? But there are those that know better, and so all that is uh, under God's everlasting judgment. That's why I say, like, my, the salvation of all that I'm talking about presupposes judgment. 
and then uh, he, he he asked me no he says to me he says we're circling back to the point yet again you assert that at some unknown time what will happen is quote the salvation of all and quote so that even people who committed unrepentant murder by flying airplanes into a building in the name of a false god will be saved uh, that's what I'm saying he doesn't understand like what I'm trying to get at and sorry and then I said yeah, we just keep going in circles until you get it I guess and I said unrepentant means yeah I also said unrepentant means judgment uh, yeah cause these people who love evil I mean they're still going to be judged like I don't know what this guy thinks I don't know why he thinks that uh, that they won't face judgment it's like I don't see how he gets that confused with what I'm saying I mean like my idea yeah, he thinks everyone like I mean that uh he means that I think everyone's going to be saved according to their own understanding. I'm like, no, not if, if they're conformed to the image and likeness of Christ and partake of his flesh, his understanding, right? So this is a consequence of Jesus' faith, his work, his righteousness. It's an eternal consequence. Not everyone wants to be con not just resurrected, but conformed to an image and likeness of God, who is Christ and Everyone is to, everyone is to, end up in the kingdom someday. I so said, I don't see how this follows. That everyone, everyone worships their contradictory view of of God. I said, if it ain't in the image of Christ, then it ain't God. And so it follows that, uh, like I was saying, that it, it leads to the worship of Christ. The, the word the, the worship like the the worship of his God or so. That's why I said Christ is the savior of all men. And so, if we we're be to if we we're able to be conformed to his image and likeness, that's to his image and likeness of his Father as well, like his God, so to say. So it wouldn't be all these people holding all these contradictory views of God. It would be as God sees as Christ sees God, right? As the son sees the father, so to say, when it pays upon his understanding of the father. But he keeps thinking that I'm talking about everyone just has their contradictory views in heaven or so. It's just bizarre. And then, uh, what did I... Yeah, I was saying, unrepentant sinners, that means judgment, so I know people don't get away with anything. That was the whole point of being judged. I said, your burden is to... Your burden is to prove judgment means eternally damned, meaning some people will never be saved, which I'm waiting for you to prove instead of making me to asking me to, yeah instead of asking me the same questions that go nowhere. That's what I was asking him or I was telling him. And he says, uh, he responded to me. He says, "You're admitting that uh, what you've admitted before. Anyone can believe anything and do anything, even rejecting Jesus, and still be saved." Since, quote, judgment, end quote, does not mean, quote, eternally damned, meaning that some people will never be saved, end quote. I don't know why he thinks that some people need to be eternally damned. As a, that, as a demonic exaggeration of judgment. This is not proven, like, you have to prove that position. And say, quote, I've already told you, no one enters the state of being, heaven, until they are converted onto the understanding of God. It's really that simple, right? Like when they put on Christ, mind and spirit, that heavenly nature, right? there's only one God. So I don't see how that leads to everyone worshiping the the the, 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 the one God according to their own understanding. It's like I repeatedly said, it's according to the understanding of Christ who is God. Right? Because he thinks everyone goes to heaven, like I said. Like Muslims, Jews, uh, Hindus, and Christians, right? <laughs> like worshiping the same God with their contradictory views that cannot be reconciled. I said, no. Like all the falsehoods are done away with and all the mysteries are revealed by God, right? 
I don't like. I told him like I don't see why this is hard for you to grasp. Like Christ preaches one God, and is the image and likeness of one God. And so, if we're all going to be conformed to the image and likeness of Christ, then we're all going to be conformed to the image and likeness of God, of one God. And so, he responds, "Is because of the way you write vagaries. For example, you say, quote, no one enters the state of being heaven until they." converted onto the understanding of God, end quote. So, one, are you saying salvation is not universal since some will never be converted onto the understanding of God and so will not enter heaven? Or are you saying that salvation is universal because by definition no one will die, quote, enter the state of being heaven, quote, quote, until they are converted onto the understanding of God, end quote. Also, you say the, quote, the, in quote, singular, quote, understanding of God, in quote, but then seem to refer to various plural, uh, it says misunderstandings, plural of God, as uh, since you wrote, quote, I don't see how that leads to everyone worshiping the same God, in quote, but then it, quote, according to the singular, I'm sorry, it says, quote, I'm sorry, it writes it confusingly, it says singular, uh, it says, quote, understanding is singular, quote, understanding of Christ who is God, end quote. I try to understand what he's like asking. It's kind of hard as well for him for me to understand what he, what specifically is the problem. I said that I said that it's just based on Paul's idea that if one died, all died. Sin and death spreads to all men over time. That's universal, universally speaking. I said it also applies to the fire of God, which is also light. It consumes all wickedness, engulfing all creation. That also means the understanding of God, right? The light. And it's universal as well. And so it doesn't matter how or when, only if it's inevitability of all things returning to God. So um, he says, so the, it's, as he said, it's as, as I pointed out, as we were saying to me, is it, it's as, of, as I pointed out, Many times already, you believe all people will be saved regardless of what they believed or what they did. Regardless of whether they denied Jesus, worshipped idols, flew planes into buildings. In the name of a god or a false god, I've also pointed out, you not only destroy ethics, you're preaching a false non-gospel. I says, please repent. <laughs> and I said, once again, that is not what I believe. I said, all knowledge is not the knowledge of God. I stopped repeating the same lie. I told him to please repent. And uh, it says, yeah, it says you're preaching a, non, a false non-gospel, right? When he says that, I'm like, a false non-gospel? I'm like, eternal damnation literally denies Jesus is the savior of all people. And even if it, even if you don't mean it right away or if a later time, it doesn't matter. You don't believe it. You don't believe he's the savior of all people. So your gospel is no gospel at all. And so there's literally no point to believe in the same way as this guy believes is retarded. It's like either he is the head of all humanity and the savior of all humanity, or he isn't. And uh, it can't be in one sense and not the other. It's like, like I told him that, no, he is the savior of all people, right? And so I'm not going to say he is not the savior of all people. And so that's what I'm, I'm saying, trying to explain that, uh, you know, like I said, there's the resurrection, there's the judgment, right? There's the eschaton. But the final state of being for all creatures is not a state of ill-being. Like some people will try to say, so that uh, you can see this in Jesus as well, how, how, as I said. As I said, that Jesus is the apocalypse of man. It's like in him is no effects, none of these like side effects or after effects of sin, fallen effect of sin, right? None of the effects of sin and fallenness are preserved in Jesus, are preserved in his being. All shall attain to that. Because all that is done with the help of God. I think he confuses. Like I said, he's, I think he's just confused on the the apocalypses, like and the resurrection and all that. The recapitulation and stuff like that. Like, I mean, I'm still trying to work on, you know, articulating it. So if I confuse them, then I apologize. But I don't know how, like, I don't know. I'll try to I'll just work on explaining it better. But sorry. Still like feeling kind of ill or drowsy for my medicine. 
So I hope I spoke clearly. And uh, anyway, if you like my videos, please like and subscribe. Thank you and God bless.